How much flesh must a robot have for it not to be considered artificial intelligence? In the horrifying grimdark future of Warhammer 40k, this is a question the Adeptus Mechanicus tech priests spend quite a bit of time thinking about and pushing the limits of. Thanks to a war against machine intelligence and the so-called Men of Iron early in humanity's history, the Emperor declared an absolute ban on AI, which they call abominable intelligence. The tech priests then began to vigorously enforce a taboo against building thinking machines. But the future needs robots and computers, and they themselves hate the flesh that they were born into, so regularly replace parts of themselves with mechanical alternatives. So instead of droids like in Star Wars, they went with servitors. Basically, lobotomized cyborg slaves that are either vat-grown clones or the unfortunate criminals or heretics that deviate from the will of the Imperium. They get most of their brains scooped out and the rest reprogrammed while their whole bodies are stuffed full of machinery to do whatever task is needed, be it maintenance, janitorial, or even combat. Something the Mechanicus talk about constantly is the machine spirit that resides inside every piece of equipment in the Imperium. But while this is definitely just part of their religion, it is also partly because every piece of equipment has a little bit of flesh in it to avoid making a purely mechanical thinking machine. You do not want to know how their missiles work, and their central computers are equal parts flesh, electronic, mechanical, and a touch of mildly demonic magic. Even their religious habits have secret meaning that even they don't understand. That incense they're often burning is not just ceremonial. It literally calms the flesh bits inside the machines, acting in equal parts like an anti-inflammatory and mild antipsychotic. Anyway, as crushing fascist dystopias go, boy does the Imperium of Man have style. Skulls and gold and flags and symbolism out the wazoo. And the Mechanicus have figured out a way to make implanting a toaster into their left butt cheek somehow look stylish amongst all the various other bits of machinery grafted onto them. So if I'm going to be forced to live through an incredibly stupid real-world dystopia, I want it to at least look the part. And for today, that means building one of my favorite parts of the Imperium, Servo Skulls. These robots are made not of criminals, but of faithful servants of the Imperium. Those that served so well in life that they're given the honor of serving in death, too. And in classic Imperium fashion, this means their skull and parts of their brain are fashioned into self-contained, levitating helper drones. They can be made to fill pretty much any task, ranging in complexity from being glorified flashlights to taking notes, providing medical aid, and acting as the closest thing the Imperium gets to a smartphone, capable of many different tasks and communication services. Now, unlike some of my friends, I haven't fallen to the plastic crack addiction that is painting Warhammer minis. I've got enough other hobbies burning a hole in my wallet as is. So instead of making a servo skull mini, we're going to make a macro. And by that I mean we're making a life-sized and fully functional one. And it'll be complete with real levitation, cogitation, and communication. To make all of this function is going to require a lot of code and frankly, probably a few prayers to the Omnisaya. But I am many things, a tech priest capable of whispering to the machine spirits, I am not. I often joke that the only thing I know how to program are meat and microbial slime. This is why I have an experienced tech priest, Magos, on our crew that writes all the code for our projects. But it doesn't have to be this way. Lately, I've been having a lot of fun learning to code with the sponsor of this video, Boot.dev. One of the problems with learning to code is that in order to learn, you must actually write code. So you need real exercises to practice with. But many of the online courses are really dry and boring, so it's just hard to stick with it. Boot.dev changes this by making it fun right from the start. Their Python course, for example, has you immediately start by making simple games and then working up in complexity. It's incredibly interactive and a lot of fun, and it works a bit like a game itself, where you earn XP and compete with other players. They have all sorts of courses, though, to learn all kinds of coding languages, from Python to Go to Java, Docker, SQL, and more. And not only is learning to code fun, it's a real-world skill that can net you a high-paying career if you stick with it. The lessons are completely free to watch, but the subscription unlocks the interactive content. So go to boot.dev and try out the courses for free.
Then use the coupon code Thought Emporium to get 25% off your entire first year if you choose the annual plan. But after that sacred tech priest knowledge is well secured in your cerebral data vault, we can return to constructing our servo skull companion. Because I'm fairly certain it's illegal to own actual human bones in Canada if you aren't a doctor, we're just going to go ahead and 3D print our skull. And we actually found a great 3D file online to base things on, which I've put a link to below. There are basically four pieces to this project. The skull and backdrop, the levitation, and then the cogitation, aka making it think and do stuff. And we're cramming as much function into it as we can. Illuminate. Turning on the lights. The finished servo skull will be given a place of honor in our office and will serve as our new secretary. Because really, who can afford anything other than an undead secretary in this economy? Anyway, there's lots to do, so let's jump right in and start with the hardest part first, the levitation. As you well know, when you drop something, gravity pulls it towards the ground. This is a rather useful property of our planet, and while it prevents us from being flung into space, it does also make levitating things a little bit difficult. What we need is some way to apply force to an object we want to levitate without touching it to counteract gravity. Since repulsor technology doesn't seem to exist in this universe as far as we can tell, I'm going to have to use something equally mysterious in its function. Magnets. We could have two attracting magnets and a rope or cable holding them apart, but the cable may as well be a solid rod for the amount that it's going to look like levitation, so I'm ruling that out. This means that our only option is to use an electromagnetic coil combined with a single permanent magnet. The idea here is pretty simple. Using a Hall effect sensor, which can measure magnetic fields, we're going to detect the distance between the coil and the permanent magnet. As the magnet moves towards the sensor, it outputs more voltage, and the reverse in the opposite direction. We'll use this signal to detect when the magnet starts to get too close to the sensor, at which point we cut the power. The magnet will then slow down and begin to fall. When it does, it'll move away from the sensor and the circuit will turn the coil back on, attracting the magnet again. By giving super fast little pulses and using feedback from the sensor, the coil can keep the magnet floating in place by repeatedly pulling it upwards just enough to counteract gravity. Thankfully, we are far from the first to build a circuit like this, so there are lots of other great videos for us to follow to debug this part. I particularly liked Hyperspace Pirate's video, and we based a lot of this on his setup. A couple super fast notes, though. First, the Hall Effect sensor must be the linear type, not digital, or this will not work. And second, make sure you use the right MOSFET and that it's rated for a lot of current. We cooked a lot of MOSFETs because when there is no magnet present, the circuit sends full current through the coil, trying to attract a magnet that's not there. If left in this state for too long, you cook the MOSFET without a huge heat sink to remove the excess heat. But once the thing is levitating, it takes a hilariously small amount of power to keep it levitating. Depending on the amount of weight we're lifting, it can be as little as one watt, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. That's less power than is needed to run half of the things in your mum's nightstand, or the average flashlight. In order to maximize our lift capability, I went with two 40 by 20 millimeter disc magnets and a coil made out of a 6 inch by 2 inch rod of mild steel. And yes, those are the units you're getting, fight me. Now, it's definitely not the prettiest coil, but it has a ton of lift. We needed about two pounds of magnet wire to achieve at least 10 millihenries of inductance. And we'll need at least that much if we hope to levitate the skull and all of the bits we plan on sticking in it. We initially struggled because our coil didn't have enough inductance and ended up having to increase it later. The bottom plate has a special space for the Hall Effect sensor to sit inside of it, and the plate was made thick enough that if the magnet slams into it, A, it won't break, or B, it won't crush the Hall Effect sensor. The best part is that because of a quirk of the circuit and just how the skull happened to levitate in the end, when power is cut, one last burst of power goes through the coil, attracting the skull to the steel core and safely catching it so it doesn't fall and crash in the floor. We did not plan this, but I'm certainly not complaining. With the levitation sorted, let's talk about how we made the skull. We went with FDM printing it for both speed and to minimize the parts. And while the print quality was great, it does have a lot of really obvious layer lines because we went with our FDM printers. 
So to help smooth things out, we made a mixture of wood filler, acrylic gesso, and acetone that we refer to as the gunk. This can be applied to the entire surface of the skull and allowed to dry. When it's dry, this layer is super easy to sand, but if it left mostly as is, it provides a rusted, crusty metal look once painted. So for the skull itself, we can sand it so it looks smooth, and for the metal looking parts, we can leave it a little bit rougher. And because it's made mostly of wood filler and gesso, it takes paint beautifully. We gave this same treatment to many of the parts to hide their 3D printed nature and make them look like something a tech priest slapped onto a piece of infrastructure of a ship that has been in use for a thousand years or more. All right, with everything well gunked and primed, we can get to painting. This was done with a combination of an airbrush and a good old fashioned paintbrush, and it always makes me happy to see a project really start to come alive as the color goes down. It was around this time that we named the skull Yorick, and I finished his paint job mostly off camera so that I could sit quietly and get the details right. Now, we did have to make a few modifications to the skull. Mostly a bunch of LEDs, but also a camera that is going to be fit into the eye. I also made three magnetic closures using epoxy putty and a few cheap magnets. The idea was that this was going to hold the skull together, but I kind of cheaped out on the magnets, so they just didn't have nearly enough pull. So they ended up being more like magnetic locating pins, and the skull eventually just got glued shut with the giant magnet mounted inside. Alright, Yorick is looking pretty, but we still need the backdrop that will house all the electronics and hide their function. So, a support arm designed to look like a steel beam to hold our massive coil, an arm for a screen, and an arm for a speaker. Now, did we check to make sure the speaker worked before it was glued in permanently? No. Does it work? Also no. So it is now decorative, and we rerouted the sound to a larger external speaker. The actual backboard was made of a bunch of laser cut pieces that were carefully glued and layered. We also 3D printed and painted a bunch of fake bolt heads to be used throughout the backdrop. Some of them are there to hide actual screws that go underneath, and others are just for decoration. Okay, now we need to talk about the candles. The Imperium, and especially the Tech Priests, love candles. They put those things on everything. On the screens, on the floors, on the walls, on a skull even. If it exists, a Tech Priest has put a candle on it at some point. And while we did consider actual lit candles, the fire hazard just wasn't worth it, so we made a ton of these awesome electric candles instead. But how do we make these 3D printed candles look like real ones? Well, with real wax, of course. I'm using a mix of soy and beeswax and this helpful little belting pot, and using it like a sort of hot, drippy paint. By slowly building up drips and layers and controlling the wax temperature, you can coat a plastic candle and have it look incredibly realistic. And the flame itself is just painted hot glue and an LED. This is by no means a fast process, and I did burn myself a few times, so if you do try this, be super, super, super careful. But if you take your time, you can get a really great looking result. But with candles and some fake wax seals and matching purity certification scrolls, the backdrop was looking really great and nearly done. With that done, let's finally talk about cogitation, which is the Imperium's way of saying thinking or calculating artificially. We did briefly consider going the full Imperial route and sticking a bit of brain in here, and while there's nothing stopping us from doing that in the future, our neural recording system just isn't ready yet, and it would be a whole separate hassle. And yes, I am serious, that's not a joke. One of our other ongoing projects is getting living neurons to play video games. I've put a link to the latest episode below if you've missed it. So for now, we're sticking with a good old-fashioned magic thinking rock, also known as a Raspberry Pi. Since machine intelligence is forbidden, we can't use an LLM-style chatbot as the tech priests would have an absolute fit. So we're keeping it simple. There'll be a mic, a speech-to-text program, and a series of specific commands that Yorick will be listening for. We also gave Yorick a voice so that he can report on the requests we give him and relay messages we send to him on our Discord server. To be one not to be is not the question. Thank you. Spheric interference. The tech priest on our crew that is making all of this work actually happens to be on the other side of the world at the moment, so she had been using Yorick's voice as a way to communicate with us in real time and be a virtual presence in the lab, which has been very fun. Parameter server died. It will reboot in a minute. Okay. Everything Yorick hears is currently being displayed on the screen. 
Eventually, as we improve this, we'll get the screen to display other information as well, but for now, this is really helpful to see if a command was misheard. It took a bit of adjustment to get all the details finalized, and especially to tune the levitator. It is very fiddly, and we learned the hard way not to mess with the tuner once the system was working. Now it's finally stable, though sometimes it's rock solid, and sometimes it does this weird bobbing up and down thing, which honestly makes it look even more like it's levitating. But with the system tuned, I can just grab the skull, move it, put it back, all without issue. And as you can see, the cable really is floppy, there's no trick wires here. Yorick has a few commands we can give him, and he responds either to Yorick or Servo Skull, and has a different response depending on which you say. Servo Skull. Praise the Omnissiah. Yorick. I exist to serve. This is just the command to get his attention, though. After his response to confirm he's listening, you can tell him what you actually want him to do. For example... Send message to Justin. Beginning transcription. Pizza just arrived. Get your ass to the front. And message. Sending message to Justin. And while this does work, his voice recognition is pretty bad at the moment, as you can see. I'm not sure what Justin's pizza juice is, but it does give us a reminder to subscribe if you've been enjoying the video. We can also have Yorick take notes for us by saying... Create Imperial Log. Starting Imperial Log Date 021.m3 Beginning Transcription. Also, some of the lights on Yorick are toggleable. The green light on the side comes on when he's recording a video, and the flashlight can be turned on by giving him a command. Illuminate. Turning on the lights. Servo Skull. Praise the Omnissiah. Extinguish. Turning off the lights. And, of course, he can record videos for you. All told, I am super happy with how this came out, though Yorick still has a couple of bugs left to sort out in his cogitation matrix. And as we keep upgrading him, we're going to make some shorts about it, because he's quickly become a valued member of the team, and we keep thinking of more things we can get him to do. This was the most Maker-esque project we've done in a while, since probably our Egyptian mummy, but it was a ton of fun. So if you want to see us do more insane prop making like this, let us know in the comments. We've got a few other man-made horrors like this in the works already. But as always, I need to say a special thank you to our amazing patrons and channel members that make these videos possible. If you'd like to help keep the flow of science videos coming or get access to our supporter discord, there's some links below. But that's all for now, and we'll see you next time.